the other one, you bastard. Brought to you by supporters who probably have better taste than this schmuck. Greetings Cybertronians, I'm Dr. Lockdown, and welcome to another Versus Review! Out of all the characters in G1, Jazz seems to have been given more chances than most, however there always seems to be an asterisk besides his releases. Regardless of which version of the character you get, he never remains completely uncompromised. Something, somewhere, will always have to be sacrificed. Is he an extremely difficult character to do? Not really, the G1 toy is pretty simple. Is the lack of Porsche licensing far too detrimental to the character? No, other characters have gotten around that licensing issue in the past. To be honest, I don't know the answer to this, I have no reason why every Every single jazz figure is lacking in at least one aspect. But that said, each jazz is somewhat lackluster in a different way. It's at least interesting to see the different angles that the designers chose, as well as the context of each release. So follow me on this glorious day as we examine three jazzy specimens. I'd make a joke about jazz music, but I already use it in the editing process, so I'll just leave it at that. Over the years, jazz hasn't experienced an evolution so much as a bunch of examples where the designers go, well let's see what we can do this time. Or at least that's the case for the vehicle mode. Aside from the colour layouts, there's quite a bit differentiating these cars. You could feasibly call these different characters and nobody would bat an eye. You've got classics Chunk Pot Pie, what the f and Sambo Tonakurasei. That said, on a base level, they can be compared, especially when you have one outlier that clearly isn't pulling its weight. But more on that in a moment. Revealer Shield turns into basically a generic sports car with jazz decos all over it. It's almost like what they did with alternators, but with a more mainline styled vehicle. I, like many people, understand why they did what they did. Porsche are basically Volkswagen on steroids when it comes to their intellectual property protection. Aside from the usual no war toy stick, if you so much as mention their names, you'll have a private SWAT team knocking at your door and dragging you to court kicking and screaming. Honestly, it's a marvel they've never gone after the third parties that dabbled in such homages. Either way though, the G1 Alt Mode was not on the cards. Oh, you got him kidding me. Yeah, I am. You're not getting a Porsche. That said, the Classics 2 pre-fall of Cybertron era delivered some truly mastercrafted car modes. Were they accurate in any way? No, but accuracy isn't what makes an alt mode good or bad. Sculpt work, paint work, build quality, these are the hallmarks of a well-designed Transformers car, and unfortunately Reveal the Shield seems to be lacking in this department. Don't get me wrong, the deco is lovely, probably the best of the three due to how extensive it is. Lovely dark blue windows, beautiful clear blue headlights, and nice dark blue tamper graphs. The blue is on show and it really pushes to bring this figure to life. And I love the outlined numbers, a detail taken straight from the G1 toy. Nice addition of the rub symbol too, even if it was the gimmick of the line. Part of me kinda misses these, although with modern budgets and an understanding that a lot of people prefer to display their robots, I perfectly understand why Haztac has moved away from it. It also easily has the best build quality of the three, although given decreasing budgets, that's to be expected. Sadly, plastic prices just aren't what they used to be. With this extended older budget though, the designers were able to add quite a few extra bells and whistles. The two main ones in this mode are the use of pinned wheels, which means it rolls the best out of the three, and the weapon storage. This is something I feel is massively underutilized these days, since with all the hollowness Transformers have to deal with recently, many of the recent Earthrise bots especially could have fit them. Just a thing to note, Haztac. Call me. But yes, it's clear the designers put a lot of thought into the fun factor of this vehicle, as there are plenty of places where they went all out. Unfortunately, those extra bells and whistles require a Solar's core to gravitate to, and I'm sorry, but the base mold in this mode is just so boring. It's not like it's lacking in mechanical detail, there's plenty here, such as the grill section and the bumper area. But as a car, there's not a lot to enjoy. Honestly, he feels indistinct from your average car you'd see on the road today, save for the deco. And even then, the off-white they chose is a little underwhelming, with that special oily quality that some do when they try to achieve that pearl effect without the budget to pull it off properly. It's not quite as bad as Maverick, but it doesn't look that good. And beyond that, what actually differentiates it from your average car? What extra steps did they take to make it stand out? The front is just a car, the doors don't do anything special to them, they're just a car. The back section attempts to go for the swish rounded aerodynamic thingo, but it ends up looking more like your average hatchback you'd see on the street, i.e. a car. Also, no paint on the back windows. Come on, mates, this is 2010, not 2015. It's not the fact that this doesn't feel like G1 Jazz. Movieverse Jazz doesn't feel like G1 Jazz, but he still has a f***ing cool alt mode. I don't hate this because of nostalgia and accuracy, in fact I don't really hate it at all. I just feel nothing from this because the designers have given me nothing to work with. In short, I just really don't care. Not caring is definitely better than full dislike though, because ew, what the f*** is this? Power the Prime's Jazz turns into a thing, space car thing, yeah what the sh** am I looking at here? This is a mess, to compensate for the lack of source material allowance, they've basically thrown every aesthetic cue at the blasted thing at random and hoped something somewhat decent would come out. It looks like one of those bad photoshop leaks where the meme lords have taken from vastly different toys in the hope of tricking people into thinking it's real. Nobody believes it and nobody believes this is a real car. Or a space car for that matter. It's like half space, half earth, all stupid race car whatever that's not really a space car and again what the f am I looking at here? The front tries to take inspiration from the downward swept G1 version but they don't 
fully commit to it, and instead you get these weird side vents that bulk out the sides without bulking up the middle. As such, the aerodynamic nature is completely lost, and there's nothing to draw your attention away from the massively oversized headlights. Also, the red paint is so thin that you can barely notice it, which is probably a good thing since it chips all the way to hell. The stripe at the top bugs me immensely. You take a look at the top, you can see it starts off amazingly. It's probably the best stock stripe out of the three, but then suddenly they ran out of budget and whoops, now it's all plain blue. But hey, at least you get the nice outlined four that looks far messier than the RTS version. You pay, I guess. The windows f suck too. First off, the fully clear plastic ends up looking cheap in comparison to the white. This tone of clear can look nice in other contexts, but against the white plastic, it just doesn't work. Also, they greebled the hell out of it for some reason, which makes it look infinitely more tacky. Maybe it would have worked if they'd used an underspray effect, which was entirely possible in the line, as we saw on the Dinobox, but they just couldn't be bothered. At least it's shitting this attempt to distract from how poorly the bonnet lines up with everything else. Yeah, I guess it's sacrifice for the combiner gimmick, but none of the other bots in the trilogy had this issue. Continuing to the back, the engine section is a joke featuring no cohesive style in comparison to the rest of it. The wheels remain unpainted, which I suppose is understandable given the period, but it still looks bad. The back section is sculpted all right, but receives no paint, which again is pretty disappointing. And thanks to the tooling on the arms, there's no f room for all these tampographs. Mate, if you know you got limited space, why not limit your tampos to one or two? Maybe that way you could ditch the reference to the orange <laughs> idiot. Oh yeah, that was a thing. Somebody totally got fired from Hasbro when they found that out. But ultimately, the biggest sin this vehicle mode commits is what I said initially. Nothing gels together. The lights don't fit with the bonnet, the bonnet doesn't fit with the size, the windshield doesn't fit with the overall shape, the engine doesn't fit with anything. Really, the only thing I can say fits well enough is the spoiler. Putting jazz aside, it's just a bad alt mode. Some of you might say, well, that's power of the primes for you, but that's not really an excuse. Pot Pie was sandwiched between two of the best lines in recent memory, Titan's Return and Siege. It was a lackluster snorefest then, and it still remains that now. I'm not asking for this to be a one-to-one -one recreation of the G1 alt mode, I'm asking for it to be good, and sadly, it flat out isn't. Oddly enough, though, a one-to-one -one recreation ended up being the best alt mode of the bunch, although pretty much by default. The designers here didn't quite have to try anything special, given the previous attempts of underwhelming and to be honest, this design choice was actually quite left field. Studio Series 86 came out of nowhere, but you can see evidence of people asking for such as soon as the movieverse got its due. Despite the fact that's literally what Earthrise was meant to be. Seriously, people are still asking for a Studio Series Optimus Prime and Megatron, even though the former already got an amazing version recently, and the latter is, well... Illegal, you know. When I first saw the leaks, I genuinely thought they were fake because something like that was so incredibly stupid that Hasbro would never do. Yeah, Hasbro really went and G1ified their lineup even more. F me. <laughs> Jazz was a weird one though, you can't just flat out recreate the cartoon model. It is very close to the toy, which is ridiculously close to the Porsche model. There's no way they'd actually do a fully accurate- Yeah, you're getting a Porsche. Yes, this time Hasbro have gotten around the copyright situation by not giving a flying f they weren't able to give Exhaust the triangle stripe yet, somehow they were able to get away with this. Not that I'm complaining though, the original alt mode is lush, and this is basically a more greebled version of that. Finally, we actually have a properly proportioned car mode with actual consistent detail, and thankfully the source material they draw from is a pretty good model to update. The front works especially well, with a prominent grille and actually visible red line. The back half is a little light on sculpting, save for a few vents under the spoiler, but they more than make up for it at the front. Vents, lines, vents, lines, f man, they went all out. They've also done extra details on the windows, to go for a slightly more sci-fi look. In this case, I actually think they did a good job, as there's a consistent style that matches up with everything else. It's also far more reserved, so it doesn't look as cluttered, and the aqua looks incredibly lush. Not as lush as the deep blue on the reveal shield version, but still quite lovely. Mad props to actually including the back windows too, something neither previous versions have managed to achieve. And sure, some people have complained about the feet on the back, but I reckon they blend in remarkably well. Besides, it's a $35 deluxe, I'm not expecting masterpiece style engineering, even if they have pulled off such recently. From a design perspective, this vehicle mode utterly tanks the competition. You can tell the designer had a real affinity for the G1 design, and regardless of which continuity you draw from when the designers actually give a shit, the end result is always great. Unfortunately, there's one element where it falls short, the deco. Both the paint and tampographs are severely lacking. The front looks great, but what are these stripes? They just don't do enough when the rest of the vehicle is covered in so much white. I understand that it's trying to be too accurate, but if you're going for that look in colours like this, certain decisions need to be made, such as maybe painting the whole thing in white. Although, seeing how Runamuck turned out, maybe that wasn't the best idea. What works for a cartoon model doesn't necessarily work for a physical action figure, and I think this is one of the cases where toy-style deco would have worked a lot better. Repro labels have shown as such. Hell, the previous two versions have shown as such. Even then, I could let it slide if they weren't using such a bland typeface on the side. Mate, what happened to the gorgeous outline? Was that one of the concessions they had to make to avoid copyright f***ery? Ignoring the wrong number, because honestly, it's just a number, and it's a nice reference to a completely different part of Transformers history, they could have still used any other typeface in the world, and they just went with bog standard Microsoft Word default. Come on, man, it just makes the toy look cheap. Which really brings the mechanical detail down. With some better paint, it could look far more premium, but as it's 
understand it's pretty disappointing. Ultimately though, I'll always take a well-designed alt mode with lackluster paint over a lackluster alt mode with brilliant paint. Collectors can always fix deco issues with repro labels or a simple paintbrush, but bad design choices are permanent. As such, I think the choice of which of the three is best in alt mode is pretty obvious. Let's get rid of the abysmal Power of the Primes version for a second, because we all know it's f***ing terrible and we don't need to go on about it. The two main contestants are the Reveal the Shield version and the Studio Series 86 one, which basically boils down to a boring car with great paint and a fantastic car mode with lackluster paint. I think the result speaks for itself. One can be fixed, whereas the other will always be your average sedan with a spoiler on the back. Point goes to the most recent edition. It's not great because it's G1 accurate, it's great because the G1 version was also brilliant, and because the designers didn't give a f*** and went all out. But ultimately, that's only one third of the package. Although to a lot of 80s fans, that's the whole package, because the vehicle mode is the primary factor. To them, I say, well, you do you. Can't say I agree though, because the transformation remains just as important to me, as does the robot mode. So after a quick size comparison, which shows that they're all basic deluxes, big f surprise, let's move onward in our pursuit of tactile happiness. Three different transformations, three completely different methods to get there, and three completely different outcomes. However, it is surprisingly easy to determine which one of these is the better one, and I don't just mean because one of them is complete garbage. There's a clear indicator of quality here, and it'll become increasingly obvious as we go along. Easily the most satisfying of the bunch would be the Reveal the Shields version, due to the auto-morph and all the extra chunkiness added in there. For clearance sake, the first thing you want to do is get the doors out of the way, it makes things much easier later on. And of course, the arms just kind of rotate out of there. They're not pegged in, and that's one thing I find a little bit disappointing about this transformation, but it gets the job done. They're not really going anywhere unless you really rattle it. The windshield untabs from the back there, and I am a little bit worried about the longevity of those tabs, but ah oh well, it seems alright for now. Bring out the double knee joints, bring out the feet like so, along with the back parts there. You'll need to make sure it's clicked into place so you've got enough clearance. Might sound a little bit awful, but once you get it in place, it's all fine. You've got this panel at the back that you push in, and as you start to push it in, this double panel will fold up like so. Although you also have to make sure the foot's in place, so ultimately it should end up looking a little like that. Not the easiest automorph, and sometimes it gets stuck, but most of the time it is pretty nice. Although I'd argue that the chest automorph is far better, even if it is missing a few tabs to lock it all into place. Take these two parts, and that'll actually get rid of the middle part in the center there. That is the most clever part of all. Oh, and I guess you also have to take the weapon out if you haven't already. You'll probably already fall out as you start to do that, though. Oh, and I forgot to talk about the reveal of the shield gun. You bring this up, rotate it down and around, and it should just kind of sit there. Not the easiest, but I guess it gets the job done. Then watch this. You fold this down, and the head pops out of there. Now that is super fun. God, I miss automorph like that. I wish it was more prevalent these days, but I know with budgets and all that jazz, it's a bit difficult. If you haven't already, just make sure that's up there so that it keeps everything in place, and you're done. Nice and simple, yet very solid recreation of the G1 transformation. It doesn't use the G1 transformation as a crutch. It uses it as in inspiration for a truly masterful conversion. Ain't nothing f masterful about this piece of sh** though, Jesus Christ. Just like the rest of Power of the Primes, this transformation is garbage. Well, a lot of Power of the Primes were just re-releases, but in terms of the new molds, yeah, there wasn't a lot to like in that line, and this is really one of the low points. Come to the bottom and untab the arms like so, on these really thin and brittle tabs. Oh joy, what a great idea. You can then bring this out on the double hinge, and oh great, two very brittle double hinges, fantastic. Separate the legs, and then bring in this part inwards, and slowly try to bring the leg out on the double hinge and collapse. It's your basic Combiner Wars transformation, except there's clearance issues with that leg on the side, which is completely f***ing bullshit. Although the other leg has far fewer issues, but you see that? Really, really wibbly. Just doesn't tab in, it just sits there wibbly. The feet pop down and you'll hear a nice solid click in there, but you don't want that click, you want the second click down so that it actually remains completely perpendicular to the rest of the leg. Really weird system that they've got two clicks in there, but oh well, I guess it works. Bring this section down a bit, which will allow you to push this whole section up, rotate it in on itself, and then push it all the way in. And it's supposed to tab into there, but it really doesn't. It just kind of sits loosely. It's it's not a very good design. And then just ignore these two hinges and just think of it as a double hinge, so push that down. And then you've got two clear tabs there and two slots there and the whole thing's supposed to just peg together. It is actually surprisingly solid for a bunch of clear tabs, but ultimately the end result still isn't worth it. Nothing is extremely awful per se, but it's not fun in the slightest, it's not satisfying. It's sh but not on a completely incompetent level, just on a it's not fun at all level. And then right in the middle we've got Studio Series 86 Jazz, who is fine I guess. For a lot of people this will be the greatest transformation on the planet, but for me I just don't see much in it. To me it's almost like a third party transformation, where the end result is the main idea, not the transformation itself. One of the clear indicators that this was not designed for Earthrise, this was its own specific thing in its own specific line. This was not a carryover, this was meant for Studio Series 
Series 86 from the outset, and I don't really find much to enjoy here. Not bad by any means, but it's just eh. Untab the doors from the side like so, from the arms there. Untab the entire back section there. Untab the double hinge from there, and you do want to be careful with this bit. As long as you're not ham-fisted, it should be fine. However, I have heard of a few cases of this whole assembly here breaking. Apparently, most of the copies that affects this are in the UK, so I don't know if it's a batch issue or a geography issue with some of the weather, but just don't leave this out in the sun, and just be very careful with it, and you should be fine. Collapse the double hinge into there, and collapse those into the back there. I do like the way the backpack folds up. It does collapse a lot into there. The arms, rotate up and around and outwards with the wheels like so, and then they rotate into place with the fists popping out of the back there and there, and the whole thing rotates around. You've got this tiny little panel here that rotates around without the rest of the waist. I think that's kind of neat. Again, not fun, but neat. Then you've got this panel at the top. You push it down, come around to the bottom, and bring it all the way in like so. But don't pull the head up yet. First, bring this down all the way, then push up the head. That way, you can avoid paint chipping on the back there. Or I suppose sticker chipping if you're going to use repellers later on. Then after that you bring the whole section up and you've got two slots there and two tabs there and the whole thing just kind of sticks together. That's pretty solid and pretty nice. Again, not fun, but definitely nice. A lot of clever ideas going on here, but they haven't really thought of the tactile nature of everything. Again, not bad, but it's just kind of eh. The only part I think is underdone are the legs. They just kind of accordion like that and there's nothing to fill it in. It's probably the weakest leg design of the three, but it does get the job done so far visual Transformers fans, it'll probably be fine. Besides, who displays their figures from the back anyway? Finally, these fold down, like so, and feet fold up, like so, allowing for the full ankle tilt, no problems there. So yes, it's not a fun transformation per se, but it is a, I guess, solid one. It's definitely form over function. Everything here is supposed to look extremely tune accurate and look extremely good, and it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, I guess it does some interesting things, but I know it's not something I keep wanting to transform back and forth like I did with Cyclonus. Easiest winner is the Reveal the Shield version. There's just no contest. We've got decent but boring and just plain terrible there, so he kind of wins by default. So, one point to the SS86 figure, and one point to the Reveal the Shield figure. And of course, no points to this thing, because no one cares. It's a piece of shit. We all know that. Moving on. In robot mode, we've got a clear definition in levels of quality, and to many that will be the primary decider. If that's what you're going for, well, the Reveal the Shield version is probably up your alley, delivering absolutely the best proportioned, best built robot of the three. This jazz looks mighty fine here. For lack of a better term, it embodies the cool aspects the best out of the three. Remember how the car mode looks pretty boring? Well, that sacrifice has allowed them to secretly craft great detail into this mode. The chest looks ruddy amazing with a nice wide profile and lots of detail. You're still missing the paint on the grill, but the red stripe is properly in view now, and the four light combo really draws your attention. Also love how prominent the wheels are on the shoulders, just like the original toy, mind you. Speaking of, lovely easter eggs on the midriff. Nice touch, shows the designers really cared. And all of this is topped off with a truly fantastic head sculpt. It's got wonderful angling towards the front, and the light piping is absolutely divine. I'll continue to say this for as long as I have to, we need light piping to make a proper return in mainline. The arms reinterpret the striped aesthetic as a fully ribbed for anyone's pleasure, piston-filled detail slots. It's super poseable and super expressive. The legs are also pretty nice. From certain angles, they might throw you off due to the nature of the automorph, but you'll quickly get used to it. Also surprised by the use of hinge joints, as opposed to ball and socket ones. It really gives them a grounded center of weight. And mate, you like play value while introducing a gimmick that actually doesn't impact the transformation? Fold-out speakers! I realize this isn't exactly how it was in the G1 cartoon, but honestly, it doesn't need to be. It carries the character essence quite well, and it's an incredibly fun feature that doesn't get in the way of anything. Would it have been better to save the budget and put it elsewhere? Probably, but it's here and I appreciate it. The only thing that this version sadly falls short in is the unfortunate wibbliness due to the automorph. The legs remain pretty solid due to the nice tight joints, but there's no tabs whatsoever in the chest. It would have been so easy to put something there, even without affecting the budget, but for some reason the designers just didn't. Come on, man, what's up with that? In a vacuum, it's not that big of an issue. You can easily leave it and move on, and even in play sessions, it doesn't cause that many frustrating moments. However, when placed next to the other two, it feels really disappointing. When it's less tight than even the power of the fuckwits version, you know something's gone wrong. That said, it's still incredibly minor in the grand scheme of things. It's a fantastically beautiful looking robot mode with chunky parts and solid construction. It's everything a modern Transformer should be, so it succeeds as a robot in my book. Even the articulation is surprisingly modern, with the only exception being the lack of ankle tilts. Aside from those, it's got almost everything you could want. Sure, the double knees are a smidge finicky, but hey, at least he has double knees. Ultimately, he's able to fully tango with the best of modern figures, and as such, he feels surprisingly modern, but then again, that's true for a lot of figures from the period. We collect good toys these days, mate. It's something we have to remember. Power of the f***ing idiots, Jazz, though, is not a good toy. If you haven't guessed from my constant derogatory comments, I really hate this thing. It's just off enough to hit me in the spot that really really pisses me off. If something's trash, I'm usually like, okay, it is what it is. Even with the exaggerated reviews I do, that's mostly showmanship. This, however, genuinely gets on my nerves. The face sculpt 
seems alright at first with the lovely gunmetal all over the helmet, but uh, where's the mouth? What were the designers on this time? Jeez, and I thought Siege Impactor was bad. The chest is ridiculously wide, whilst the torso itself is stupidly thin. Once you notice it, you'll hate this design even more. Although you won't at first due to the ungodly backpack that goes out sideways from the waist. Also shows you any imperfections in the mould. F*** off, mate. And oh uh, look, the shoulder hinges reveal the huge hollow sections on the side. What the f***? Mate. If I had to pick one part of this mode I actually enjoyed, the shins would be that portion. They're pretty well painted and have some lovely sculpting to complement it. No clue why they painted white over black though, when the whole thing is sculpted in white to begin with. Seems a bit odd. Still, this is easily the best part, but looking at this makes you notice how horribly proportioned the thighs are. They honestly look like cartoon bones, given how they have to compress into the car mode. Also wobbly as hell, not as bad as the real shield chest, but it's another annoying thing to add to the pile. For me though, the two worst parts are things you wouldn't normally notice. For starters, I think this panel at the front looks like dog shit. It makes an effort to peg but it just fails miserably so it wobbles around and doesn't blend in with the rest of the torso at all. Yes, this design isn't the easiest to do in terms of flow, but given the combining aspect, it probably would have been easier to ditch this idea altogether. However, that's nowhere near as stupid as the final issue. See these wrists? Those are wrist swivels that don't f work due to the panels! <laughs> Mate, if that doesn't sum up this figure perfectly in a nutshell, I don't know what does. The whole f thing is misguided from the outset. Yes, I understand this is meant to be a combiner, and as far as combiner limbs go, it isn't the worst in the world of that job. The arm looks pretty decent from the front, with quite well done proportions for the car bonnets. The front of the car actually makes some pretty cool shoulder mass. That ends up being pretty f hollow from the side. Come on, mate, you can do better. I know you can because Rook basically did the same thing, but far more successfully. Same thing with the leg mode. It starts out looking really good and it's surprisingly solid given the loose ass double hinges and tabs, but why did this section at the front have to be hollow? And yes, I'm fully aware that this figure has to do a lot of things. It has to be a car, a robot, an arm, and a leg. That's a lot to do, but keep in mind pretty much all of Combiner Wars did the exact same thing and at the very least turned out decent. Well, except for Brawl, but that's one dud figure in an entire line. The faults of this shitty jazz are obvious. The push to make him also accurate to the Generation 1 version. Making a G1 accurate jazz would have been fine, and making a combining jazz would have also been fine, but adding accuracy to the already stretched combination system was the straw that broke the camel's back. And even then, that's not going into the god-awful hands and feet that Popeye introduced. The only reason I haven't mentioned them is because I've currently lost them. The point is, this toy is trying to cram too much into the deluxe price point, and the designers clearly weren't able to succeed in this undertaking. It's a mess, which makes him the perfect poster child for the closing end of its trilogy. Not even the articulation works well. Every joint is either far too loose or incredibly rickety. And mates, those wrist swivels, they're probably the funniest thing I've seen on a Transformer in ages. I've owned this toy for years, and until I was sitting down in the car back from Melbourne writing this script, I never even noticed. It is incredibly stupid, and part of me finds that endearing. That endearment isn't enough to make me love this figure, though. Legitimately, the only reason I haven't sold him off is the controversy of his decos. Because of that, he remains an interesting, if to some infuriating part of Transformers history, but outside of that, there's no reason to purchase him. He's the easiest out of the three to skip, and it shouldn't even be considered when figuring out which jazz to get. F*** this thing, it's terrible. And then we have the Studio Series 86 version, and... Uh, oh boy. This is gonna be a bit of a controversial opinion. I want to preface that I don't hate toon accuracy, and B36 is Toon accurate. He's f***ing amazing. Most of Siege and Earthrise have Toon Accurate robot modes, and we still got fantastic figures out of them. Look at how Toon Accurate some of the recent beasts are. They're still awesome with their engineering. This version of Jazz doesn't have that. The design itself seems to be lacking something, and it's not like there's an amazing transformation to make up for it either. It's not bad by any means, but there's nothing fantastic either. It's just average, that's all. I like the definition of the cheeks on the head sculpt, and it's definitely serviceable, but like the angles on the RTS one easily outclass it. The chest works well enough, and props to them for actually keeping the Autobot symbol on show, but the shoulders and arms have basically nothing to them. The black plastic is pretty much an unfocused glob and the arms are doing the bare minimum. He comes with a pretty nice gun, but it doesn't really do much in terms of its sculpting. I like how filled in the midriff is, and I especially like the waist highlights, but the thighs, again, do the bare minimum. Instead of the layering on the shins that the Power of the Primes version had, it's basically one big glob of silver. I like how clean the backpack becomes, and even though I prefer the door wings look, I appreciate them going to the trouble here, but ultimately it feels like the designers didn't really care. It seems like they're using the Sunbow model as a crutch, much in the same vein as Earthrise's <laughs> voice. Going screen accurate is fine, but in toy form you need to deliver something beyond that. It's like the difference between Cheetor and Black Arachnia. Technically, both are accurate to the CGI model, but only one of them goes out in all the detail and transformation. And to reiterate, this is by no means a bad figure. The only thing I can feasibly consider a flaw is the backs of the legs. It's not the hollowness, honestly, who f***ing cares? It's the fact that they unpeg really easily, which is pretty annoying in play sessions, more so than the wibbliness earlier. But beyond that, what good is there to balance it out? Not a lot, really. He's fine. Just 
fine. Matter of fact, the entire Studio Series 86 line has been quite similar. While I can't speak for Grimlock, and I certainly hope he acts as the exception to the rule, the other toys I've gotten have been just as boring. Take Blur for instance, I guess the alt mode's kinda nice, but the robot mode is pretty lackluster. Compare it to his Titan's Return counterpart with a nice clickety and satisfying conversion, it just doesn't stack up. Sure, I don't own Titan's Return Blur, but I've seen it in person, and I own his mold mate. There's just no contest here, especially when they f his head sculpt so much. What happened here? The chin is far too elongated. It's like what G1 is say animated stylization is without really understanding the design philosophy. Those remarks are meant to be an insult, not an actual plastic action figure. For that same reason I passed on Cup. I already switched out the face once, I'm not doing it again. Plus, what are these proportions? No thanks. Then there's Scourge. So f boring. Matter of fact, both Scourge and Jazz were in the running for having a review done, since the idea for this particular video could have worked for either of them, but I ended up selling Scourge. In fact, by the time this video goes up, he should be at the very least on his merry way. And I ended up keeping the blast effects because they're purdy, but in a nutshell, you've got a fantastic Generations 2010 version with surprisingly exceptional articulation, and then you've got the Times of Turn, or I suppose the Takara Legends one, with its unique transformation that still allows it to look incredibly close to the original model, even with the Headmaster gimmick. Aside from accuracy, what does SS86 offer? What does he bring to the table? All articulation he has is shared with the 2010 version. The transformation is the most boring of the three by far, and honestly I prefer the Takara Legends vehicle mode, with its far more swish stylings. Both of these can be considered screen accurate, but only one of them uses said screen accuracy as a crutch for lazy engineering. People have hypothesized, including myself, that Studio Series 86 was a compilation of Earthrise's sloppy seconds, but after getting a lot of it in hand, I just don't think so. The engineering isn't nearly as satisfying as even the worst of Earthrise's releases. This feels like the more boring entries in the regular Studio Series line, your average car formers that only exist to fill waves and tick characters off the list. It makes sense given this is a Studio Series figure, but it's sad because Jazz could have been so much more. Now to fans of the Sunbow model, this will probably be the best thing ever created. I'm fully expecting this to top a sh** ton of best of 2021 lists, but for everyone else, including me personally, there are no standout moments to make you give a sh**. Even the articulation seems average, which is weird because out of the three, he's easily got the best. It's just that when you have a figure with lackluster sculpting, it seems like there's far less motion here. Although I will say, props to them for not painting the bottom of the feet so that they avoid paint chipping. It's legitimately smart and a nice change of pace compared to some previous reviews. Maybe one day, after Repro Labels, this will become the best f figure of the line. Maybe he'll actually end up on my own best of 2021 list after I apply them. Such as happened before, I hated Siege Red Alert out of the box. But with the sticker set, he easily became one of my favourites of the mould. But as it stands right now, this is a bit of a letdown. This makes comparing the three somewhat difficult. Not impossible, mind you, but I get the feeling my diagnosis is going to royally piss off at least half of my audience. If you're a huge fan of the screen model, your decision has already been made long before even watching this video. You're going to froth all over SS86 jazz, provided you can find one f scalpers these days. Even the sizing works best since they've deliberately made him a little smaller to scale with modern toys. But if you're like me and don't care about accuracy or scale, then it's surprisingly difficult. Let's ignore the Power of the Primes version for a minute, or rather an eternity since no one cares about the f***ing thing. Out of these two options, one has the better alt mode whilst the other has the better transformation and robot mode. Even then, it's real close, because many people will take a look at that alt mode and flat out say that's not jazz. Still, I think the Reveal the Shield one edges out ever so slightly. If you want a fun toy like I do, then you're in luck because many people are swapping out for the newer version. Actually, fun fact, that's how I originally got my copy because someone swapped out for the Power of the Primes version. Oh, that poor, poor soul. So that's my take on the subject. For me, Transformers are a tactile action figure. If it's not fun, why bother? There's fun to be had with the SS86 version, but there is so much more fun to be had with the Reveal the Shield classic. However, even then, the popularity of screen accuracy cannot be understated. A sh** ton of people hold that above all else. And that's fine, the community is known for its vast range of opinions, and the purpose of this video is merely to share my own. Whatever your opinion may be, though, there's virtually no reason to pick up the Power of the Primes version, even if you find the pathetic nature of the political easter egg humorous. There's simply too many compromises from trying to cram too many ideas into this thing, and ultimately it ends up being a shit show. This thing is easily one of the worst deluxes of the line, taking a tight spot with the Moonracer mold. I still stand by my opinion that buying the whole combine of those bastards is just ridiculous. I'm sorry, just because the character exists in toy form is not a good reason to purchase them. Then there's the SS86 version, and the best person for this figure is the type that has an extreme affinity for the G1 cartoon. Don't get me wrong, I grew up with the G1 cartoon, so I have an affinity for it, but not to the extent required to truly adore this figure. Don't get me wrong, it does a lot of good things, but it doesn't go above and beyond. Maybe he'll look amazing with repro labels, but out of the box, he's just average. The vehicle mode is great, but as a transforming figure, there's just not a lot there. Conversely, the Reveal the Shield version has a monotonous vehicle mode, but it makes up for it with everything else. Much like many toys of the period, it's very hard to top what they did here. Not impossible, but 
ridiculously hard. If you need an all-round brilliant representation of the character, or just a decent toy in general, then honestly, this is the way to go. That being said, as amazing as he is, I don't think this is the end for Jazz. There's still plenty of improvements that can be made to the character. I reckon that the perfect Jazz is still on the horizon, one that satisfies both the accuracy crowd and people like myself who enjoy a more fun overall experience. And yes, I'm fully aware that there are some amazing options in third-party legends and third-party masterpiece, but I'm talking about Chug in this instance. Because let's face it, Takara's never going to make a masterpiece Jazz, it's just not happening. But it's not like Haztak is never going to make another Jazz again, given his prominence in the first season of the cartoon. I reckon within five years or less, we'll probably see another one on shelves. So ultimately, all I can do is wait for that to happen. Let's see what the designers give us next.